Hello everyone and welcome to the final session of Virtual Visions 2020. My name is Jason Menzo and I'm the Chief Operating Officer here at the Foundation Fighting Blindness and I'd like to welcome you back here to Raleigh, North Carolina to our home and, uh, and I, I wanted to say thank you and share how much I really appreciate all of the many folks who participated in Visions this year. Um, a couple years ago when we began planning Visions 2020 and all of the special um, milestones and accolades and important uh, elements associated with 2020, I don't think any of us imagined what was going to be happening in the world as we're seeing uh, today. And so this shift to virtual and what we are now lovingly calling Virtual <laughs> Visions 2020 um, was kind of unexpected, but in some ways was really special. Did you know that over the last few days we've been able to welcome thousands of folks to participate in Visions, many more than we would ever typically see in a live Visions. We've had thousands of folks participate in the live sessions, in the on-demand sessions, uh, watching on Facebook or YouTube Live, and, uh, and, and really participants from all over the globe. And so in some ways, this has been a really special experience for the year 2020. And I'd like to say thank you to, to everyone, both those that typically attend Visions, but also especially to those that are new to the fighting blindness community and joining us for the first time. So I'd like to welcome you and I, and I encourage all of you to consider taking part in our Visions 2022, which is in a couple of years, obviously, two years to be exact. Um, but, uh, but, you know, this is a, a great way to introduce our mission to a broad audience and hopefully a lot of you uh, come back and participate in other events that we have uh, in the months and years ahead. Um, I know this, this really wasn't the same as a live Visions with everyone in the same room, but regardless, I hope that everyone took away some, some special value from the scientific content, be it some of the updates on gene therapy or genetic testing, um, or maybe even the non-scientific information from a lifestyle perspective, the, the session on technology or the session on depression and isolation, which is really important um, in, in the current pandemic and the environment that we're in right now. And um, all in all, I just hope that on some level, everyone was able to connect with the content and importantly, um, from a social perspective, because I know that one of the most important things that folks get out of Visions is the ability to connect personally with other people in the fighting blindness community. And hopefully many of you were able to participate in the socials and some of the other engagements that we had identified and, and brought to you over the last couple days and were able to connect with one another on a social and personal perspective. I'd like to thank all of our presenters, all of the many, many folks that were involved in producing and bringing all the great content to life. Without all of you, uh, obviously this wouldn't be possible. We had presenters from all over the world as well. And it was amazing to watch this team of folks come together and pivot over the last few uh, months to shift to this virtual environment to make Visions 2020 the best one yet, despite it being virtual. Um, as a reminder, all of the sessions, everything that was presented over the last few days, the live sessions as well as the on-demand ones, will be available on our website in the weeks ahead. And so if there was a particular session that you didn't get an opportunity to participate in, but you really wanted to, you will still have that opportunity to participate online. So just be on the lookout for an email from our team in the next couple weeks announcing when everything's live. And then finally, one last thing before I introduce our very special speaker. I'd like to thank all of our sponsors and our exhibitors, uh, in particular our national sponsors, including Spark Therapeutics, Biogen, AGTC, Genentech, Janssen, Mira GTX, and Aura Clinical. And a very special shout out to our exhibitors who stepped up to the plate and entered the great unknown of exhibiting in a virtual environment. And so a very special thank you to our exhibitors, the Guide Dog Foundation, Leader Dogs for the Blind, and the Usher Syndrome Society. You could say that our next and final guest speaker for Visions 2020 it has a very personal and special connection to our mission and to the foundation. Uh, but quite honestly, that would be a massive understatement. Um, I'll put it to you this way. Gordon Gund is an amazing human being, period. Full stop. 
He's a world-class investor, a very generous philanthropist. He's owned multiple professional sports teams and is actually an incredible sculptor. If you've never checked out his artwork, you really should. It's, it's something incredible. Um, among many things, probably some of his most cherished accomplishments are things that he's accomplished within our community at the Fighting Blindness, uh, within the Fighting Blindness community as one of the co-founders of the Foundation Fighting Blindness so many years ago. And as we approach our 50th anniversary in just over a year from now, it's amazing to think that Gordon is still very active and very involved in many of the daily things that we are dealing with and many of the things that we're focused on every single day, including our investments and our finances and reviewing scientific grants and applications. Um, he's still very up to date on everything related, the, the, the search for treatments and cures for blinding retinal diseases. And it's been my pleasure getting to know him over the last couple of years. And it's, it's my extreme pleasure to introduce him to you all here today. So with that, I'm going to turn things over to Mr. Gordon Gund. Hello, everybody. Thank you very much for attending the Foundation Fighting Blindness 2020 Virtual Visions Conference. It's great that all of you were able to hear some, if not all, of this. And I hope you've come away from it understanding just how far we've come with our research effort just since the last conference. It's just remarkable, the progress that's being made and the excitement and promise of it. So I hope that comes through. And I want to thank all of those who presented to, in this conference over the last three days. One of my most memorable moments is when my wife, Luli, and I first met with the Burmans and with Elliot Burson and realized that we really were going to be able to get something going and, and that we could coalesce this all around what Elliot was proposing but my hope was that we could carry it way beyond that, and I'm, so was my wife, Luli, so I'm very excited we were able to do that. And when she got really into it, she started the first ever chapter of the foundation in 1972 here in central New Jersey in Princeton. It really became a model for the way we expanded beyond Baltimore, the headquarters of the foundation, into, at the high end, nearly 50 different chapters around the country. We have close to 40 now, but, but it was a real high point to see how far we could take this. And we also started an international federation that involves 32 other countries, just from all the public relations we did with regard to this on, in any way we could. But it was really her, uh, doing this with her was great. And I wanna, I wanna take a moment and just give you some context for what, how Dr. Alan Ladies, who was then Back in the early 70s, the a professor at University of Pennsylvania headed up uh, ophthalmic research for them and, and was very highly regarded and, and very successful and accomplished with what he did. We were lucky to get him to become the first chairman of our scientific advisory board. He has great abilities as a leader. He's open-minded. He listens. Uh, he is forceful if need be, and sometimes with the members of the Scientific Advisory Board, that, that can come in handy. He's also um, a very wise, very kind, and a wonderful friend to all of us and to the Foundation. So how did this happen? We got, uh, let me go back to a little bit early of the early history. In 1971, my wife Luli and I were put in touch by Elliot Burson with Ben and Beverly Berman and a handful of other people. And we agreed at that time, because of the uh, tremendous frustration that we had over the lack of research going on into retinal degenerative diseases and, uh, and the lack of understanding about the retina and the lack of understanding about the visual process, and especially about retinal degenerative diseases and what caused them, we felt it was very important to start a research effort. And Elliot provided the, the catalyst and the original incentive for doing that. Elliot Burson was then a young investigator at the Mass Eye and Ear Infirmary and affiliated with Harvard University. And he had decided he wanted to start the first multidiscipline laboratory for the study of these diseases for anywhere in the world. There, wasn't, there weren't any at that time. And so to do that, he, he had Mass Eye and Ear and Harvard said, well, you have to prove to us, you, you have to raise $600,000 in order to construct and equip that lab and be able to carry early on the operating operations of it. So 
we took that challenge and started then with that challenge and with a real focus of, of a very targeted focus. And we started to put out the word, a lot of publicity uh, to try and get the word out about our endeavor. And, and we started to raise money, hopefully hoping that we could raise a lot from families that were affected with these diseases. Uh, as it happened, with, uh, within six or eight months, so the middle of 1972, we had raised that money and we're, and we're most of all incredibly impressed by the number of people. We had no idea how many people would respond and how many people there were with, with all these retinal degenerative diseases. A much, much greater universe than we had thought. So that helped us become very confident that when we, once we had the original lab, which was eventually called the Berman Gun Laboratory at Mass Air Infirmary, was going to happen, we thought we really ought to expand the scope of this effort because there's a lot more opportunity to do research both around this country and throughout the world. So as we thought about that, we also realized we were not confident that we could design and develop a multifaceted, very complicated, agile, and always changing and robust and credible research program. We needed to have a scientific advisory board, and if we were going to do that, we wanted it to be world class, because we had no credibility for, the, for that kind of thing. And so in, in the process, uh, we got very lucky in the early fall of 1972 to have identified for us and have talked with two keys, those being Dr. Alan Ladies and Dr. John Dowling. John was professor of biology at Harvard and chairman of the Department of Biology, had a very accomplished research career. So along with Alan, who also did, the two of them gave us instant credibility in terms of attracting others, other clinical researchers and other biological or, or other scientific-based researchers uh, in basic science that had great reputations as well to our scientific advisory board. They identified them and they, they persuaded these people to join in. And so the very first meeting of our first scientific advisory board, which was, was held in April of 1973 under Alan's leadership. So Alan really instrumental in getting this group together and then in motivating them and uh, moving them along to decisions, a great manager, as well as all these other abilities that I mentioned that he has, and was able, therefore, to get ourselves started to populate the field with young investigators, both as clinicians, clinical researchers, and also basic science researchers, to get started on the effort to build a knowledge base of these diseases and about the retina and about the visual process, but also to understand the causes of these diseases so that we could start to find treatments and cures for them. So when we started, we had the same mission. We were then called the RP Foundation, and same mission as the successor organization, the Foundation for Fighting Blindness, has today. And I must say, the under Alan Lady's leadership and knowledge about this, he was a, a consummate reader of all of everything that was published about retinal degenerative diseases and about new technology that could come into play, like PCR technology other things that could really make a difference where the research headed and to filling the gaps of that research. Since the 32 years that he did this for an amazing record, I think, and an amazing series of accomplishments, he really evolved this whole effort. This has really moved into a very special place and you can really feel how, how this research is going. I am John Dowling the Gordon and Laura Gunn Research Professor of Neurosciences at Harvard. I am so delighted to contribute to honoring Alan Leakey today and to recognize his enormous contributions to the Foundation Fighting Blindness. I came to know Alan in the late 60s when we began a collaboration to study a new type of retinal neuron that Alan and his colleagues had discovered. I quickly learned how marvelous a person Alan is and how excellent a scientist he is. Alan joined the foundation shortly after it was founded and served as its chief scientific officer. He was the ideal person for the job, extraordinarily knowledgeable and both a superb clinician and scientist. His objective, of course, was to understand RP, about which we then knew very little. 
I became involved when Alan asked me to join a small group of retinal scientists to evaluate directions the foundation, then called the Retinitis Pigmentosa Foundation, should take. What research should be done? This group eventually morphed into the Scientific Advisory Board, but was then essentially an executive committee. We met on occasion, but Alan was in frequent contact with us by phone. Soon we were off and running and making progress thanks to Alan. The Berman Gun Lab at the Massachusetts Eye and Ear Infirmary was the first sizable group effort undertaken, but soon RP centers involving both clinicians and scientists were established around the country, all overseen by Allen. The foundation grew, changed its name, generously supported research, but a big breakthrough had not yet occurred. Allen kept his cool, kept asking the right questions and plunged on. Then in the early 90s, the breakthrough did occur when Elliot Burson, director of the Berman Gun Laboratory and Ted Dreija discovered the first gene that caused RP. The floodgates then opened, and today we know of several hundred genes that caused RP. But how to cure RP? The scene now shifted to Philadelphia and the foundation's dog facility there. Gene therapy was in the air and tried on a dog that had a retinal mutation present in humans. This was Lancelot, who found his way to the halls of Congress, demonstrating to all how well he could now see. Now, of course, we have successful gene therapy in man, a tremendous advance, and all along, Alan was steering the boat. What a wonderful story that owes so much to Alan. I salute you, Alan, and thank you for all you have done for the foundation and for vision. Hello, my name is Dr. Jackie Duncan, and I know Dr. Ladies through the Foundation Fighting Blindness. Dr. Ladies was the very first chair of the Scientific Advisory Board for the Foundation Fighting Blindness, and that is a position that I am privileged to hold at this time. My fondest memory of Dr. Ladies is one of the first times that I met him. He took me aside and asked me to think about why patients with retinitis pigmentosa develop macular edema. Well, it's a very common problem that causes vision loss for many, many patients. And he asked me to think about it from a very basic, fundamental, mechanistic perspective. And that's what I think distinguishes Dr. Ladies and his many contributions to the fields. Dr. Ladies has an incredible whole handle on the basic science and the mechanisms of photoreceptor degeneration. And he's able to apply that understanding to clinical problems that cause patients to lose their vision. For that reason, Dr. Ladies has been a role model to me throughout my career, and I thank him so much for all he's done for the field of inherited retinal degenerations. Hi, my name is Eric Pierce. Alan Laites was a colleague of mine in the Department of Ophthalmology at Penn, and my predecessor as chair of the Scientific Advisory Board for the Foundation of Body Blindness. I have many fond memories of Alan and working with Alan, especially since Alan is a natural storyteller I think the one I'll comment on is how Alan introduced me to the FFB family. So I was a junior faculty member at Penn, working hard on getting my own research program set up, and Alan showed up in my office one day to ask me to join the Scientific Advisory Board for the Foundation of Fighting Blindness. And many of you know that an important job of a junior faculty member is to say no to as many requests like that as possible so that you don't get distracted and you keep your focus on your own research program so your career can develop in advance. During our conversation, as I was planning on how I was gonna say no to Alan to this request, he invited me to attend an FFB meeting, I think on Amelia Island. And somehow, even though I didn't know Alan very well, he convinced me that I should attend and I did. And before I knew it, I was caught up in the FFB mission and felt like part of the FFB family. And it was really that family that sucked me in and has kept me engaged in FFB for the past 18, 20 years since then. So Alan accomplished his goal, not so directly, but gradually by letting the experience and the story suck me in, just like 
He often motivates people by telling stories. At this point, all I can say is I'm thrilled, I'm glad that Alan thought to include me on this journey. Thanks, Alan. All the best to you and all the best to your family. Thanks very much. Hi, it's Steve Rose. I was Chief Research Officer, Science Officer since 2004 till I just retired. I had the honor and privilege of knowing Alan Ladies because of his encyclopedic knowledge of retina and the science, the foundation is where we are today with respect to being able to fund and make research and clinical work available for clinical trials and the first FDA approved gene therapy for a genetic disease for LCA that came about directly because of Allen's leadership in the early years as Chief Science Officer of the Foundation. Allen is a truly inspirational person, scientist, and a true fantastic director for the Foundation in its early inception. Without a doubt, without Allen's leadership, the Foundation would not be where it is now. It's important to recognize the several decades of loyal service, brilliant service provided by Alan Leites to the Foundation Fighting Blindness. If it weren't for Alan's brilliance, fairness, impartiality, energy, and efficiency, the Scientific Advisory Board would not have been what it became. It, it's all due to Alan's credibility and his hard work and his reputation for recruiting the very best scientists to serve on a volunteer capacity, the FFB via its Scientific Advisory Board. FFB's rep reputation for funding only the best research stems from Allen's high standards. Everybody associated with FFB knows all of this, and we're all very grateful to you, Allen, for your wonderful service to all the scientists in the country and around the world who have benefited from FFB. Thank you. I'd like to ask everybody to stand up with me and give Alan and his wife, Dina, a virtual standing ovation. Alan, thank you, good friends. Success will come in increments. We've already got real success. We have, I don't know if you know this, but we have the very first gene therapy to ever receive approval by the FDA for any inherited disease. So it's r remarkable to get that far, and Dr. Allen Ladies was a huge part of that because when it became possible to sequence genes and genotype people and understand or certainly identify for most of them their def the defective gene, and then learn about what that defect meant in the process and work through it as we did in the 90s with the gene for, uh, for a form of Leber's congenital amaurosis called RPE65. And we, we took it from the gene discovery all the way through to understanding that the protein the gene normally made, uh, when it wasn't made, was not producing a very important result in the visual cycle and, and at the very front end of the visual cycle. So by being able to replace the normal gene into the cells of the eye, the photoreceptors of the eye, we were able to suddenly almost turn on a light switch and start an incredible new cascade of photonic energy into electric and onto the visual cortex of the brain. So we really, that was huge. And so that's a success. And the gene therapy delivery system that we helped develop is also, both of these things are tremendously successful in terms of not just eye diseases. There are, there are over 30 trials going on right now with different uh, diseases, not just eye diseases, but others, using a lot of that same science. And as I started to say, Alan Ladies was hugely helpful to this. He understood once people could be genotyped, he realized we really ought to jump on this, which we did in the mid-80s, and we started funding an awful lot of genetic research and genotyping work. That's what's really moving the field forward in a great way now, as it is research on other diseases, non-eye related. So that's a very exciting success. I, it'll go in steps, and I think that we've got lots of great things going on in regenerative medicine, in cell replacement and transplantation, with uh, what are 
called induced pluripotent stem cells. They're like embryonic, but they're not. They're cells from people's skin that, is, that can be transferred or changed back into a pluripotent embryonic-like stem cell. So it can be then turned into almost any cell in the body. And the thing that's great about it is your, your immune system isn't compromised because it's your own cell. And also, it's great because it, it gives you so much flexibility in a dish to grow these cells and to find treatments that might, might help them, things that might work with them, that you, that you don't, so you don't have to do it all in humans. You can, you can shortcut the process, and that's coming. I think we've already had some, we've got a lot of research going on about it. There are a lot of novel medical therapies that are under investigation now and look very promising for, for some people. There's even something called optogenetics where if the retina is gone, like mine probably is, the rods and cones aren't, there's not a lot, a lot of life left there. So to put drugs in to them may not work, but, you, but optogenetics means putting a substance that's light sensitive and is what the retina first experiences when light shine, is shown on it or when the eye looks at any image. And that's a, a chemical called rhodopsin. And so if you can put that chemical, uh, introduce that through the same delivery system that we use for gene therapy, but into the layers of cells behind the photoreceptors and behind the retinal pigment epithelia, but into, let's say, the bipolar cells that are back there, or the nerve ganglia cells, so you can, they can suddenly become photoreceptive and able to take images and light in. And that's, that's happening in animal models right now. Another thing that uh, is happening, and that Alan Ladies played a key role, and he sensed back in the late 80s that things were starting to happen, and we were gonna have some legitimate, very critical therapies coming along, and we needed, there's a big step from the laboratory to the clinic, and you have to get FDA approval. I, I'm sure it's generally known there's something called the Valley of Death. That's trying to translate laboratory, successful laboratory research in, into the clinic and to get FDA approval to go into humans to start with and then to find first safety and then efficacy in humans. So there's a, and a lot of, a lot of potential therapies die in the so-called valley of death between those two things. And it's very expensive to do it. So any way we can find to shortcut that uh, will, be, will be a very successful step. And we'll not only work it for eye diseases, but I think for almost every kind of disease, even non-inherited diseases. Because if, if uh, we can do that, that will allow other clinical trials to be done at far lower costs and at far greater speed. So those are the kinds of, I mean, there are successes all around this, as well as the biggest one will, of course, be when we go out of business, because we've done it. I hope with this conference that you've again, gotten a feel for the direction of the research and the incredible progress that we've made. And we have had some success with some of these diseases, but we've been lucky enough over the years to have a lot of people involved, both on the Scientific Advisory Board, probably more than 100 people, and a great board under Jackie now. We've funded more than several thousand researchers over this time. We have had probably a couple hundred people over this time on our professional staff. It's remarkable that we've had probably tens of thousands, probably close to 100,000 volunteers and donors over the years that have, that have been responsible for fueling this incredible de research development that's taken place under Alan and Eric and, and Jackie and so many more. Uh, and we now have, I think we are positioned because we have a great SAB, we have a great team in terms of the professional staff under Ben Yerksa and Jason Menzo. And we have an incredible volunteer leadership under David Brind, the new chairman of the board. Well, not new anymore, about two, th almost three years, he'll tell me, and he'll tell me, don't expect it to last too long. And then we have a great team of officers and a great national board and terrific people out in the field in all of the chapters. So we're really poised now to achieve most, if not all of our mission, I believe, within the next 10 years. It's no longer a question of if we will. It's really now more than ever a question of when. And it's gonna take all of us to, to do that, to be part of this, continue to support it and to continue to rally other people around it 
in order to make that happen just as soon as possible. So thank you and stay well.